Yeah. It's working. Okay, so we're just going over enums. Okay, so an enum is like an algebraic data type in Haskell. It's a lot more like that than it is like a C like enum. And this is how it looks, right? You go enum, and then the name of your enum, and then your your variants is what they're called. Uh, like this, it actually is like a C like enum. Like okay, so enum. Yeah, that's actually the name of that. C without. The yeah, it looks yeah. it looks just like C so far, right? So if we stop right here, it is like C, and it works like C. Like it actually assigns them integers, or actually, and, and it works fine. And you can actually use this form to interoperate with C over FFI. Oh, nice. So it matches exactly. But then, like, it can, it can also, here's the syntax of, like, using it. Uh, you, you use the name of the enum, and then colon colon is your scope operator, and then whichever variant you want. So that's, like, I'm going to set this variable to that enum value. Um, so you can always just have that empty enum variant, which is a lot like a C variant. Uh, it has no data associated with it. You can just tell it's, oh, it's an empty, right? So here we've got an enum dispenser item. So I was thinking like uh, Team Fortress 2 dispenser, you know, something like that. <laughs> uh, or you could have, you could get like ammo out of it. And it has like some amount of ammo. So a U8 is your byte, right? And here, this variant has a type associated with it. It's saying, okay, I contain one U8 value. In so this variant, you uh, you went eight underscore t and c. Yeah. C plus plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could do a tuple of data. So I'm going to have a string and a number. And this type, and this is a signed 32-bit integer. Or I'm going to do a whole struct. Oh wow. So I'm going to actually have named fields oh. with types and everything. Like you can have all of that in an enum. And like a C tagged union, you can be any one of these things, but only one at a time. So you can be one of those values. Right. Okay. Right, so you can say, okay. Uh, also, you can bring things into scope, so you can just, you don't have to go dispenser item colon colon every time you type it. So I, if I do with this use statement, that'll bring empty ammo things in place into scope, so I can just say empty, stuff like that. So here I'm just making a variable, and it's an empty. And so I, just, I sort of go through all that. Well, I can make a variable with a 42 in it. I, I can make a things that has this string and that number, or I can make a place with these x and y's. Like that's all this, like just sort of examples of, of using an enum or creating enum. One of the cool things, another cool thing that like C doesn't do is you can associate methods uh, with, method, methods and functions with your enum. Mm. So here I, I'm saying, okay, well a variable that's type dispenser item now has a display method. And then I could put my implementation there and now it's curly braces and like do whatever I want. Whenever I call it dot display, on a variable that is the enum. And let's see, and there is a, this is what we're getting into. There's some really common enums in the standard library that you use all the time, option and result. So here's option, and whenever you're reaching for a null in a C-like language, you wanna use an option in Rust because you, you can't have null pointers in, in Rust. So instead you can have an option. So it's either a none or it's a sum variant that contains something. Now this is also using generics. So that angle bracket T says some type, I'm just gonna call it T, and it has no bounds. So it can be literally any type. So this enum works with any type inside of it. So you're parameterizing the type. Exactly, exactly. So then I just go through that explanation. You, uh, you don't have to name it T, you, it's an arbitrary identifier, but the convention is you sort of use T or U yeah. or something like that. So that's what you'll see more, most often. Because it comes after T. Oh, okay. Like if you have multiple, if you just have two, it'll often be T U. Oh, okay. Just it's really common in Java for T U V. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. Yep. Can I ask a completely unrelated question? Is anyone sure. else's brain trying to find the difference between the two monitors? Because I'm looking at my like, okay, case, but I know they're the same code. <laughs> but I'm used to looking at a dip file. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Should we hang but a curtain over one of the stuff. monitors? <laughs> yeah, I'm like literally one just eye. telling my brain, no, it's the same code. It doesn't, you don't need to find Have the you found the, the ten differences? Start circling them. <laughs> I think that's just you. It's just, no, no, it happens to me all the time when I'm, when I, if I'm ever presenting oh, and I'm looking at the monitor while I'm presenting. Oh. All right, so let's see. So because enums can re represent all sorts of data, you need to use patterns to examine them. So patterns are like the other side of enums. To use them, you've got to use patterns. So you've got to understand at least a little bit about of them, about patterns. The easiest thing to say about patterns is they look just like, you can use something that looks just like the variant 
and just put a variable in the, the location where you would use have a variable. Oh, this is like assigning a new variable within an if. Yeah, so, okay. so here, if let, it, so if let goes together. This is an if let statement. And what it does is it takes a pattern on this side and if it matches your value over on this side, then it will it will go through this and say like, okay, where are your your variables? Oh, you want an x lo local variable for whatever's inside the sum. So if you have the sum and it contains any value, it's going to make a local variable x for the scope, and then you've got it. Whatever was in the sum is your x over here. So that's how you use things. You use it in in places where you use patterns. So, so you said it was local. So only within the brackets is is that is the, is the variable yes. applicable? Yeah. After the, after that curly brace, x is gone. Okay. Yep. And if this is the non variant, then the entire if statement would not run. Right. Right. So this is it's looking at an option which is only some or none. So if it was none, this wouldn't match. That would make this false. It would just skip it. Yeah. Well, but like, what if you didn't just, want to skip it, right? Well, that's where match comes in. I was gonna say it's like a single. It's just a single. Yeah, actually, if let is syntactic sugar for a match. I believe it's literally syntactic sugar where it replaces it with a match statement with the other branches just as a default. It does nothing. Could you mm -hmm. reverse that so the sum is on the right and the my variable is on the left? No, no that's the syntax. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of weird. Like, it, it's a little mind bending at first because I wanted the same thing. I'm like, why can't I put my variable I'm over so here? I'm so used to the variable being the name being, yeah. So. But it, for whatever reason, they made that choice. But on match, the syntax is a lot more normal because it's match my variable. And then you put your, art, your patterns. Oh, this is like a switch? This is, this is just like a switch, only more powerful. It takes patterns instead of only. Values. Yeah, and it can be yeah. an expression. It's an expression. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yes, and it's an expression, which is just awesome. So, so here we're we're doing our sum, and then. Why did you tell me about rest? There's our dude. arm. <laughs> were you holding back on Will? Did you just barely tell him about rust? Why did you tell me about what kind rust? of what amazing. kind of friend Why are you, AJ? <laughs> You're here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so anyway. You've got a fun weekend ahead. You're not, yeah, no, you're no, not no, a very no, good no. stalker if you're not here about <laughs> Rust. Yeah, so uh, here, here's, here's your wildcard syntax. If you put an underscore, that's a pattern that, that matches anything. Where's my, where's my cursor go? So if it's not a null, then that's the wildcard. Uh, if it's not a sum, then it will hit this wildcard. Yes. All right, so what's the difference between, is right between the last slide and that? Is this um, or is essentially it nothing. Line? Okay. I'm just demonstrating like okay. this is a wild card. In, in this particular case, there only was a none, but if there were more variants, this would catch them all. Well, an important thing about matches is they're exhaustive. So if you had, this is for the option which only has two variants. But if let's say that you had the number had ten variants, you need to list every variant yeah. as part of the match statement. Unless you have this underscore, which means I acknowledge there are other variants, match anything for this yeah. case. Yeah, wildcard. Okay. Could you have a none and an underscore? Sure. Okay. And, and it goes in order. Okay. So like if you you could put like whatever you want, and you put a wildcard at, at top, it'll never reach anything else. Okay. Also, you don't need the return statement. It just. No, no, no. They didn't make the mistake Java has, which is you have to break. Oh, I'm so sorry. On fall through. Yeah, like you don't. You default. don't have to break. Oh my god. Yeah. You don't it's have like to break. JavaScript does that too. Yeah, you have to use break. So let's see. Wait, so you can't do return? It like enforces a break. I'm not no, you sure. Can return in a match. I'm oh. pretty sure you Why? can. I thought it were in Java. It, oh, like, the match is an expression. Like, Once it matches it, like it, you don't need the return, or like no, the return. No, I was I was asking if in Java you have to have a break even though you're going to return. Is that? To be honest, in yeah. Java I rarely really use a re case a statement. return. This is Java talk. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, so so here's here's an example of of um, actually using the match as an expression. So if you've got the same return type on all of your branches, which you actually have to do, but you can use it as an expression and actually capture that return value. If you do that, you need to add that semicolon on the end of the brace. Right? If you're not actually using the return value of a match expression, you can cheat, leave off the semicolon, it's fine. And this is actually true for all braced expressions. All braced expressions can be used 
you can use the value. And if you do, you need to put a semicolon. And if you don't, well, it's because you let, it, the let is a statement. That right. It's using the expression of a match as its assigning part. All right, I don't know if you cut the right side of my hand. Well, technically, like, you need the semicolon anyway. They just, they just made, they just hard coded it so that they would, Im they could infer it yeah, the, if the you're not using it in a larger. Yeah, the, the semicolon statement. is for the let statement. Yeah. 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 All right, and uh, that's that's pretty much my, my enum section. Then I go over like option results specifically, if you're interested. But like for a lightning talk, that's probably plenty. Oh, I'm all for more. You want you want more? Yeah. All right. So option, we are, we already looked at the definition, and it's used whenever something might be absent. So here's how you create the none variant, right? Just assign it none. Um, so I specified the type that some will wrap here in the angle brackets. So here we've got generics again. And notice I don't have a use statement bringing into scope option. Remember in that dispenser yeah. thing, I had that use so dispenser like use, colon colon star. Space. Yeah, the reason we don't need to do that with option is it's in the standard prelude. That's the list of things from the standard library that are brought into scope by default. So for option result in a, 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 a several of the standard library enums, they'll just be in scope. Not all of them, but some of the most common ones will. Um, a lot. Shocking yeah. amounts. Option and result are used all over the place. They're seriously the two most famous common enums. Uh, if you ever use option with a concrete type, it'll infer that type, so you don't need to specify it. So you can just like leave it out like that most of the time. Uh, there's a handy helper method called is sum that returns true if x is a sum variant. There's an is none, does the opposite. There's a whole bunch of other useful methods, but I'm not going to go over them because there's like 45 of them. Why does that work? Why does what work? The four in, so the, what? Ah. Options implement. So into option implements into iterator, so you can treat it as a vector of zero or one items. So you can actually go for i in an option, and if it is a sum, it will give you it in the i. So that's another way. You remember we did that if let before. This is exactly the same thing, only it's using a for. That would throw me through a loop. I'd be. You can also unwrap an option, and it will panic if it's a none. Oh well, I know that one. That's all over. <laughs> Uh, wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh -huh. It iterates over a non iterable what? It's iterable. Yeah, it, it implements it to iterator. Option implements it to iterator. It has zero or one items. If it's a none, it has zero items. I, I, and if it I, will, can't, I can't argue with that. And if, it was, <laughs> and if it's a sum, it has one item. Okay. You're blowing so. my mind right now. Yeah. <laughs> you can also do that with your own user types. Like if you just make some weird structs. You can implement into iterator yeah. and use it in a for loop in some weird way if you want. To. But why? Why would you? Why would you want to do that? Why would you? If you wanted you want to, to use a... map or filter or like some of those other iterator adapters, mm. or if an iterator adapter returned an option and you wanted to keep going on in your chain. Um, yeah. So you've never are used it like that, though. I've never seen anybody do this. No, that's, yeah. that's a little this bit weird. weird but it's a little weird. But that's, that's a really cool way to highlight that it implements it. Yeah. That's very interesting. It's like, yeah. It has all these capabilities. Go read them, is yeah. basically my point. And then we go on to result. So here's the definition of it. Um, it's wrapped. So the type wrapped by OK and the type wrapped by error are different, right? You've got our T and E for any type and in error type. Um, that's just, I want to point that out. Oh, is that so like the first time I've shown a multi-parameter generic. I think I've seen that in C++ where you have to use the return, mm. right? Is that what that is? That's what the must use annotation is. Yes, it will give you a warning if you don't use the, if you don't inspect the result to see like, what is it? And that's because Rust really wants you to decide what to do with errors. Mm -hmm. Doesn't want you to just, Oh, oops, I didn't realize it was returning an error that I needed to look at, right? So let's see. Um, yeah. So here's like an example from the file system module here. I bring in file and I want to open a file, right? Well, the file might not get opened successfully, so it returns a result. 
But right here, I'm not doing anything with it, so if I try to compile that, I get this warning, right? Unused result, it must be used. Why is that a warning and not an error, if it must be used? Because it doesn't force you to, but... Why not? I don't know. Well, you can Go conceive of an instance that you don't actually care, I yeah. suppose. Maybe then you just do assign under, you can assign underscore it. That's all. Yes. Yeah, so it should force you to at least ignore it. So the, the way but to ignore it is so let underscore that. equals. Um, Would it give you a warning if you didn't use an, a variable? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of warnings. Rust is a proper yeah. language. But just like Go you'll notice modern. most Rust software will not have any warnings. Right? The convention is you don't allow, you fix warnings. Like, I, I did a lot, I, I, I ran Gen 2 for eight years. There's a lot of software that emits a lot of warnings and everyone just ignores it in C, right? And some other languages. Running that is not typical in Rust. Compiling Linux from scratch and the Linux from scratch project. It's warning, like, warning, oh yeah, warning, most of these warning. tests may or may not pass, but it's okay, just continue. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So wait, 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 wait. You're saying you invent a language that's meant to make software safer and higher quality and you don't want errors in it? Yeah. This just doesn't make any sense. I don't have but an opinion very, over whether it, it should be a warning or error. It's also very purposeful. They, they give you the constructs to acknowledge why you're doing something some way, which is what your next slide is for, right? Like if you kind of didn't care, you didn't have some mitigation strategy for the file not opening. <coughs> it's still gonna ask you to do something yeah. to acknowledge that you made a conscious choice to not mitigate the error. Yeah. Most, I think my point is just like, most warnings are treated as errors in Rust. Yeah. There's also that in C, they can force warnings to be errors. You can't ignore them. You it's can do possible. that with uh, Rust as well. You can add a config file or a command line argument to say, well, my warnings actually are errors. Well, there's also uh, the annotation you can put at the top of a module. Oh, true. Yeah, true. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, okay, so what do you do with it? Like, okay, one thing we, we do with that result is we could just unwrap it. Unwrap it, super simple. If, it's, if it was successful, it gives you the value. If it was unsuccessful, it panics and crashes. <laughs> so you want to be careful with that one. Uh, expect is actually exactly the same as unwrap, only it gives you a message with your panic. And let's see. So you can do things like, okay, well, if I check if it's okay, an okay variant first, then, I, then unwrap will always succeed. So like this unwrap will actually never crash, right? And which I sort of like. It better not. It <laughs> better not. It's a magic bit for me. Yeah. And of course, you can always just do your full pattern matching and say, okay, well, if it's a... If it's an okay, I'll do some, stump something with my file. If it's an error, I'll do something else. And I don't have a slide for it. This is actually the end of the section. But like you could, you could actually say, well, in my error case, I want to diverge. I want to return from the function or something like that. And then you could say, like, I want my variable to be assigned the result of this match expression. Then it, it'll always get the file, or it will return from the function. Assuming main wasn't like the main. The well, even if you return from main, it exits the program. It's still, it's still valid code. Try to return the, so it converted to int or something. Oh yeah, so that's an interesting thing. Is the main function doesn't return an int in Rust? So um, you can return anything that implements the. I think it's the termination trait. Uh, in Rust, so nothing implements the termination trait, which will just always be successful. There's also a standard process exit where you can specify an exit code, or there are uh, errors. Uh, there are errors that implement the termination trait. So, like if yeah, you return, return an error, or a result, yeah. implements termination trait. And anyway, 